It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer. The lighting is dim. We lost another bulb. Anyway, it's our customary procedure. The light emanating from this pulpit will make up for it. Mm -hmm. It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the opportunity of rebound if necessary. Many people apparently don't understand it. If we name our sins to God, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. And since many people will be listening to this message, I'm sh damn sure, God the Holy Spirit is the mentor and the teacher. God the Holy Spirit is your mentor and your teacher. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you're not going to get anything out of it. I don't care if you listen to a thousand tapes. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you're not going to get anything out of it. I don't care how much you exercise. If you're not filled with the Spirit, you're not going to get anything out of Bible doctrine. You must be filled with the Spirit. And God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we've forgotten. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, you have the opportunity to be filled with the Spirit through the function of 1 John 1 9. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God so that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, so that we might glorify Him, in whose name we pray, Amen. Now after much longful prayer and consideration that uh, myself and my family have had, we have all come to determine that most of Christendom are full of jackasses. Most of Christendom is full of jackasses. I didn't even need to go through longful prayer and consideration to understand that. So anyway, let's hear what evil has to do with. Evil has to do with lack of humility. Lack of humility. And people have a lack of humility. I've read enough of the Bible <laughs> more times over than anyone would ever know. And I know enough about the Bible to know that many people despise youth. How can he know so much and be so young? I got to know more. They did the same thing with our Lord when he was 12 years old. How does he know so much when he's 12? Something called the unique spiritual life that few people have, have not gleaned onto or understand. They're too busy fiddling with the, the details of life. So therefore, evil... Evil includes a system in which you reject authority. Also, evil comes up with a solution to the world's problems. And the world's problems can never be solved apart from Bible doctrine. And they can never be solved apart from the laws of divine establishment. All of this politicking going on and trying to solve the world's problems will not work. And instead of nitpicking other believers, you need to be executing your spiritual life because our country needs it and our country's falling apart and I guarantee you it's going to fall apart shortly. We don't have enough people who know enough sense to come in out of the rain. They want to be offended. They sit around waiting to be offended. They fold their hands just waiting for the wrong word to come out of the pastor's mouth and then, hmm, I can be offended will be offended and be offended all the way to the fifth cycle then you'll really be offended you see when you do not have humility that is genuine humility this is a principle write it down and I'm doing this off the top of my head I'm a clone clone this those without those without genuine humility those without genuine humility. Well, see, I am a clone. I couldn't figure out what I was going to say next. <laughs> Those without genuine humility are going to fall apart. 
You see, you know what it needs to happen to those without genuine humility. They need it enforced. And what that means is simply this, divine discipline. Those, without genu those who have genuine humility will avoid divine discipline. Those with genuine humility will avoid divine discipline. Those who have to have their hum humility enforced are those who, are, who need divine discipline. And that enforced humility comes from divine discipline. So denominations are evil, by the way. All systems of denominations are evil. So are all independent service organizations such as the uh, Council of Churches. Most denominations, by the way, last about a hundred years before they fall apart. The Baptists may be lasting a bit longer, but uh, they, they sometimes they start out teaching a little doctrine, then they fall apart. But evil is what you think of as an apostate, reversionist, liberal, or a bleeding heart, guilty type person or a legalistic bleeding heart person who has to prayerfully consider things. You don't prayerfully consider things! How much doctrine have you learned? You doctrinally, doctrinally consider things. You put things into perspective from what the Word of God has to say. Prayer is not a problem-solving device. How many times do I have to say it? Well, obviously about a million times for those who only show up every Sunday. Nod to God. Nod to God. You need to be listening to your tapes. I've always thought that. And I've always thought it was ridiculous somebody wanting a pastor. They thought, well, we'll just have a pastor. We'll be like all the other places. No, you won't. It's going to be a whole different scenario. And if you've heard any tapes, you know who's the authority. That is, correct tapes from people who are in authority. And if you've heard me, you know who's in authority. And if you don't like it, I don't care. You see, there's a big problem in Christendom today. And that problem is this. And it's a problem I don't care about. Well, I care about the problem in that I want you to learn about it. But if you don't want to learn about it, it's none of my business. And I don't care about you or the problems that will uh, result from that. And this, uh, these problems include this. There is a uh, type of uh, behavior in Christendom today in which you think you can hurt someone else. And that's called happiness. Well, they think they can get happy. Well, let's look at happiness. You know why people do certain things, whether it be from the old sin nature or whatever? They're looking for happiness. And what most people in Christendom, Christendom today are doing, they're trying to build their happiness. Build happiness on someone else's unhappiness. And they think if they can make someone else unhappy, that somehow they'll be happy. Whatever, that might be wrong. Someone else's unhappiness. Build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness. To build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness doesn't work. You can't do it. There are a lot of people, I know, well, there are at least a few people out there who think that if they can make me unhappy, somehow that'll make them happy. You don't understand sharing the happiness of God. You don't understand the spiritual life. You don't understand that when you have the ten problem-solving devices, nothing can make you unhappy. Nothing that the world does to you, nothing that mankind does to you, nothing that people can do to you can't make you unhappy. You lose a lot of friends to make you unhappy? No. Why? You have rapport with God and Christianity today. That's the biggest problem. What are they doing? Well, they're trying to make everyone else unhappy that they don't like. If they don't like someone, they're going to make them unhappy. If they think someone has done them wrong or has done a friend wrong of theirs, they're going to try to make them unhappy. And it's not going to work. It's especially not going to work with that person who has grown enough to know what the ten problem solvings are all about. Ten problem solving devices are all about. And if you don't know what the ten problem solving devices are all about, that's your fault. And if you don't know what the ten problem solving devices are all about, 
you're going to run around trying to make other believers whom you dislike unhappy. And it's not going to work. You're going to make yourself unhappy. And not only are you going to make yourself unhappy through all of the desires of your sinful nature. That's where it comes out from. Unhappiness. You see, what, what are you going to do? You're going to say, I want so and so to be unhappy. Why? Well, you have a dislike for them. And you think it'll make you happy to see them suffer. You think it'll make you think it'll make you happy in some way to see someone else suffer. That is the stupidest thing. We're all on the same team, whether you know it or not. We're all all of us who have believed in Christ are on the same team. But people on the same team are trying to make each other unhappy. You'll see that in, at work in the South. A lot of workplaces in the South are filled with believers. Many times, everyone in the same workplace will be believers. And yet, believers get in competition in the workplace, for example. And they compete with each other. And they think that if they can make their competitor unhappy, they will become happy. That is the stupidest, most childish thinking in the world. That takes you back to middle school is what it does. It takes you back to being a sophomore. It takes you back to being an idiot. I guarantee you this. Nobody's going to make me unhappy. I have a relationship and a rapport with God. People don't make me unhappy. Oh, if they irritate me, I'll rebound. But I don't stay unhappy very long dealing with people. Why? You got doctrine. You don't need people. And people have, and Christendom has the wrong idea. They need a big church. If you don't have a big church, well, you just have a little church. And they speak con condescendingly. I'm leaving your little church. I don't care. You think I care? You think it bothers me? You think it makes me unhappy? Why even tell me? How many times have I told you leave a church quietly? How many times have I said that? For those of you who listen to me on a consistent basis, you know that I've said it several times. You leave a church quietly. You don't have to make an excuse. You don't have to come up with some type of uh, thing to say, well, I'm leaving because of this or that or the other. It doesn't matter to me why you leave. Maybe I'm not your right pastor. Maybe Colonel Theme is, and I hope and pray you keep with him because if you don't, as stupid as some of you are that have written to me, you'll never make it without sticking with the Colonel. You stick with the Colonel. Forget me. You don't have enough uh, gumption. You don't have enough... Uh, uh, self-discipline. You don't have enough of anything to stick with me. Not to say, well, you have to stick with the Colonel. Just to hear your tapes whenever you can hear them is what I'm saying. Listen to your tapes. Stick with your tapes. Grow in grace on your tapes. And I say that because I know certain people will listen because they want a reaction. Well, this is a, re this is a response and not a reaction. I'll respond to you. This is how I respond. I've been teaching you doctrine. If you didn't like it, leave. But I hope and pray that since you've left, you will stick with Colonel Thame. And that almost rhymed. Mm -hmm. Stick with Colonel Thame. Stick with that doctrine. Grow in grace. And you've got a long way to go and you've got to have the humility to understand that. Some of you thought you couldn't learn from me because I'm young and you despise my youth. And that's fine. Stick with Colonel Thame. You can learn from him. Learn from him. It does not insult me in any way. It does not bother me in any way. Because guess what? I'll be up here tomorrow for two hours. I'll probably be up here on Saturday for two hours. Maybe even Sunday unless I decide to go fishing or something else. Or do something else. Or go to a movie. But I'll be up here whenever I want. And I'll teach whenever I want. And I'll teach as much as I want. And it'll be on the internet. And the odd thing is, is these people think, some people think, that the, <laughs> some people think they were the only ones in the congregation. I've had people ordering since this thing got started. I've had people ordering since this thing's got started. You're not the only ones. You don't impress me. You don't make me unhappy if that was your intention. And it was. You can't get around it. You don't make me unhappy. I am not unhappy. 
I am happy that we've separated wheat from chaff. That's what I'm happy about. You know, we have the most well-behaved people I've ever seen. You say, ah, it's just a few. So what? They're well-behaved. They don't hop from seat to seat. They don't get in a chair and whirl up their blanket and go to sleep. And they don't munch on their little uh, stuff that they're eating and make a big scene in which uh, other people sitting beside them had a hard time listening because they were going crunch, crunch, crunch. And I never said anything about that. I could have been a lot tougher. I should have been a lot tougher. But those days are over. Now I don't have to be that tough. In, in, in order to, and that's a wonderful thing. It's relaxing. It's relaxing to know, hey, these people want to listen. Those other people wanted to cause trouble. These people want to listen. Now there may have been a few that uh, did not want to cause trouble. But those few had no control over anything. And they would not even see what their family was doing behind their back. They would not see the funny faces I would get. I had a good view of the whole church. They didn't. They would not see the bitter looks. They would not see this, that, or the other. And they just they couldn't understand it. And they were led by the nose without an understanding. And people today don't understand. And people make decisions without understanding. People make decisions without all the facts. But why would someone make a decision without all the facts? Because they're trying to build their happiness on someone else's unhappiness. They've been offended. So they'll offend back. Or try to. You're not going to make me unhappy. It's just not going to happen. You are out of your mind if you think that. I'm going to keep going. And in fact, the greatest thrust of this ministry is outside of Anderson. Anderson's a dried up place. No one here cares for doctrine. But people scattered throughout the country do. And since we have uh, internet and all of that, it's, uh, we can get orders from elsewhere. And I have been getting orders from elsewhere. But if I weren't, it wouldn't matter anyway. I'd keep going. Look, people, I'm 29 years old. I know this doctrine. I teach this doctrine. I teach it more than anyone alive today. Chew on that. I teach this more than anyone alive today. And I'm going to get ordained. And one day God's going to place me somewhere. You think you can make me unhappy? There's a plan and a purpose. And let's say God says, you know what? Everybody's negative. You can't do this anymore. You think it'd bother me? No, I'd go on with great blessing in a job somewhere. I'd go live in the climate that I love. I'd go skiing in the winter. Well, I'd go live in the climate I love. Cold. But that usually changes when you get older. Everybody then runs to Florida. Well, I'll run to Florida when I get old, if I get old. But the whole point is uh, people are so narrow in their thinking and it all has to do with the old sin nature. And they're so narrow in their thinking that they just, they just have to cause a scene. Well, let them do it. Big deal. Evil is a deviation from Bible doctrine and the laws of divine establishment. Now we'll have the etymology of the Hebrew word referring to evil. First of all, ah, Wayne. Ah, Wayne. Awain, Hebrew word referring to evil. And Awain means evil in the sense of nothingness or vanity. Nothingness or vanity. Awain means nothingness or vanity. You know what nothingness and vanity includes? A lot of things. The details of life. The details of life? Nothingness. When it comes right down to it, money is nothingness. It has its use. But uh, an unbeliever can make $40 billion and when they die and go to hell, what is it? Nothingness. Ah, Wayne. All the details of life are nothingness. Yet people had to try to turn nothingness into something. And they said nothingness is more important. They even went so far as to say cheerleading. Cheerleading of all things. I can say these things. There's nothing wrong with it. Because you don't know who I'm talking about. Oh, you may, but no one else does. 
cheerleading. That's nothingness. Nothingness. Vain. Vanity. It's a girl seeking a clap because she can shake her booty. If you want to break it down into its simple terms, that's what it is. Do you not agree? Have you ever seen a big fat cheerleader? I never have. Have you? If you have, it was so the school could make fun of them, which is silliness. And it's still nothingness. It's degrading. And maybe some school would do that just so that could happen. Who knows? But it's nothingness. It's vanity. If you don't love doctrine, your whole life is nothingness and vanity. And you know what? Some people are going to get the idea they're going to be able to get up and teach on a Sunday and put something together on a Sunday. And they're going to get that idea. What about Monday through Friday? Or maybe they'll even try to throw in a Wednesday, maybe a Tuesday. You won't get anybody to show up. But if you tried that, uh, it's going to be so much work you're going to reduce your hours, I guarantee it. You cannot do this without the gift. You cannot stand up and teach Bible doctrine every day without the gift, period. You can't do it. And people seem to have a hard time understanding gifts and spiritual gifts. There, are spirit, there is the spiritual gift of pastor-teacher, which holds authority. Nothing special about it. It's all given by the Holy Spirit. And then there's gifts of administration, which some people have, but then they get a hot head or a big fat head and think, well, I need to be top cheese pastor. If you don't have the gift, it's not going to work. And there are a lot of people without gifts with big congregation. You know, there are a lot of unbelievers with big congregations. That's not the issue. The issue is always doctrine and what's being taught. It's not the man, it's the message. And I guarantee you everything that flows out of my mouth, as long as I haven't screwed up with a uh, flub up of the tongue, it's going to be accurate. We all screw up with a flub up, and then I'll correct it if I'm reminded of it, and I will be. So we have a Wayne. Why you look like that? I'll be if I mess up. Somebody's going to say you said this when you should have said that, and I'm like, oops, okay, I did. I'll straighten it out. So a Wayne, and then we have Ra, and Ra means evil. R A, adjective R A. I won't write that on the board. That might insult some of you. Ra, R-A, <laughs> means evil, bad, worthless. And there are a lot of evil, bad, worthless people. You know who the evil, bad, worthless people are? People are trying to build their happiness on someone else's unhappiness. People who try to make someone else unhappy. You know why? <laughs> I don't know why. Well, I do know why. The old sin nature. And they try to make someone else unhappy because it may be in the past you wronged them. Maybe five years ago, maybe ten years ago, let's say ten years ago, let's say ten years ago you did something that really made someone else mad. Ten years ago. And you know what some people live their whole lives doing for the next ten years? They try everything to make you unhappy everything whatever they can do ten years ago you did something to this person ten years ago they got really upset about it ten years ago and now you bring it and now you try to make somebody feel unhappy about it that's not spirituality that's the old sin nature spirituality does not seek to make others unhappy and this definitely applies in the workforce because most of our lives, when you have a job, at least half or even more of your life is spent at the workforce, believe it or not, when you have a job. If you have a job at home, it's a whole different story. But when you have a job that you have to get up and go to and come back, it is a different story. And you have to go there and you have to sit by that person who's constantly gossiping. And you have to sit by that person who's constantly trying to make others unhappy. And you have to. You mean you have to sit there. That's your job. And there's a tendency for you too to get sucked into that. So and so did this. You see, they might have a ten-year-old grudge against somebody. 
And what are they going to do while you sit beside them in your cubicle? They are going to use false information. They're going to take tidbits of truth and then about to 90% of falsehood for you to go against the person they want you to go against. So you join them into trying to make this person unhappy. Men and women do this both. Men who do it are weirdos, but they do it. Men do it probably just as much as women, especially when their authority has been trounced on, when they think they have an authority. So here's a person over here, cubicle number three. Cubicle number two is the one who's pissed off from the ten years ago. <laughs> cubicle number one. Now what does cubicle number two do? So-and-so. And this is a person over here in another area, cubicle number four. Out of earshot most of the time. Or you try to make sure they're out of earshot. And then, all the talk, cubicle number two. So-and-so thinks so highly of herself. Talks to cubicle number one about this. Cubicle number one starts to think and say, eh, I think I have your same opinion. Cubicle number one comes up with the same opinion. And then cubicle number three has been listening as well. Comes up with the same opinion. Now you've got three people trying to make one person unhappy. Now if this person down here doesn't have doctrine, it'll work. They'll become unhappy. They'll become miserable. They may even quit the job. They may say, I've had enough of this crap. I'm tired of being looked down upon. I'm tired of this, so I'm leaving. And they may quit the job. That would be the wrong thing to do, however, especially if you're a believer. If you are a believer in Christ, and you're under system testing, and there are three different people talking bad against you, that's a system test. And these three different people come down and unload on you and you know they hate you and they know they want you to be unhappy well forget that if you have plus eight sharing the happiness of God that nonsense won't mean a thing to you you'll glide right through it not only will you glide through it I'll tell you something that will happen if you have the ability and the humility it takes humility if you have the humility to stick through it you'll find out something God will eliminate number two God will eliminate number three and number one once you pass the system testing. And they'll be out the door and suddenly you're promoted. You're promoted. And you're promoted when God promotes you. Now that goes with business. But uh, let's say you don't get promoted in the business. Let's say you stay happily down here in cubicle number four. Well that's fine. Guess what? All these other people are gone. And if they happen to stick around as long as you do, well, you'll just have to keep using those problem-solving devices, won't you? You don't just leave a job because people are mistreating you. And that goes for the pastor as well. You just don't leave a job because people are mistreating you. I've never left a job because somebody was mistreating me. And believe me, it's happened. I won't give you details, but it's happened to everybody, so why would I give you details? You've had it happen too. You can just know to yourself, it's going to happen to everyone because everyone has an old sin nature. And we're talking about down here in the South where many people are believers. And there's believers doing this to other believers. Why? They think they can be become happy by making someone else unhappy. That's satanic. That's satanic thinking. You know what? God, tr I mean, Satan. Satan tries to make God unhappy all the time. Did you know that? That's Satan's job. As soon as he said, I'll be like the Most High God, it was his intention to make God unhappy. And if God ever becomes unhappy, he ceases being God, by the way. God's always happy. God wasn't unhappy when... Satan rebelled and said, I'm going to be like you. That didn't make God unhappy. God wasn't unhappy when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit. Didn't make God unhappy. Yet they were rejecting him. Didn't make God unhappy when Israel rejected God. And it's not making God unhappy when America rejects God. Who's it going to make unhappy though? All the people 
in these United States who aren't on doctrine or who don't have humility. Oh, some people claim to be on doctrine, but they know about a thimbleful. And then they think they know enough to be to run around and run at their mouth. Uh, I had a, uh, a middle school teacher, no, a high school teacher. I had a high school teacher at uh, who, in 10th grade. He called that verbal diarrhea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what Satan has, verbal diarrhea. And that's what a lot of believers have is verbal diarrhea. I read emails that's nothing but verbal diarrhea and untrue. Simply and totally untrue. These people don't spend any time in prayer. It's simply untrue. Absolutely untrue. And if they do spend it in prayer, it's so, please God, don't let me go to jail. Please God, don't let me go to jail. That's their prayer. Think they're mourning over a church? <laughs> it's unbelievable. You, it's unbelievable. Don't look at me crazy. I'm right on. It's unbelievable. I say these things because suddenly these people aren't going to show up, but they're going to be listening to this one, I guarantee you. They'll listen to this one. They won't listen afterwards. Oh, they may. I might have something else to say tomorrow. Listen again, please. What I'm telling you is the, 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 it's, it's a bunch of bull. And you just don't... Uh, it's just somebody trying to make somebody unhappy through a bunch of bull. And that's all it is. And you just have to ignore it. That's all. So why aren't you ignoring? To teach a point. That's why. I don't have to ignore it. I'm the pastor and I can teach a point. And that's called... AUTHORITY! Now let's look at the noun ROA. R-O-A. R-O-A. And that means badness of quality, evil. That's about every Christian today. Christian today. R-O-A. Roa. Roa means badness of quality, evil. Then we have the verb ra-a. Ra-a. You kind of get the sense from the Hebrew what God thinks about evil. Ra -a! And that that's R A A and that means to be evil, simply to be evil. Now from the Greek we have etymology. From the Greek we have etymology. You might want to steal this for your Sunday message. Ra -a, and then from the Greek we have kakos. K A K O S. Kakos. K A K O S. And that means evil, bad, and worthless. Evil, bad, and worthless. Kakos. Then we have the adverb. Or we have the, there's also an adverb of kakos, and that means wickedly. It's spelled the same, but it's used in adverb form, and it means wickedly. That's number two. Then we have number three, kakia. Remember adakia? Well, now we have kakia. K-A-K-I-A. -A. That means depravity or wickedness. That's referring to religion. Then we have the adjective Poneros, and that means evil, worthlessness, degenerate. As a noun, it means the evil one. As a noun, it's actually referring to Satan, Poneros. The noun Poneria, P-O-N-E-R-I-A, means maliciousness or sinfulness. Then finally, in the Greek, we have phallos, P-H-A-L-L-O-S, Listen carefully how to pronounce it so you'll know how to pronounce it. Phallos, P-H-A-L-L-O-S. That means evil in the sense of worthlessness. Now the origination of evil is, of course, Satan. Satan is the originator of evil. And evil originated and existed before human history. Evil existed before you. You produce evil, but evil was here a long time before you ever decided to produce it. Evil originated and existed before human history. 
This means it was transmitted from a previous creature existence, Satan. It was transmitted from a previous creature existence to our existence. It was transmitted from previous creature existence <laughs> to human history. And what this comes out to mean is very simply this. We take on Satan's thinking <laughs> when we go into the cosmic system. We take on Satan's thinking. We might as well look at some of the things that I've created in terms of Satan's thinking. Satan's love for self equals Satan's self-righteousness. You should have these cards. And 2 Corinthians 11.14 talks about how he masquerades as an angel of light. So he masquerades himself as an angel of light. And then Satan uses deception. And as part of deception, he uses scheming. And believers do the same thing. Now let me go back to what I was talking about in scheming. Believers scheme all the time. And why do they scheme? Why would a believer scheme against a, another believer? Because here's unhappiness down here. unhappiness. Now what the believer does in scheming, he tries to build his happiness on another believer's unhappiness. Now how is that possible? It's not. Here's building block number one, gossip. See how they build? Well, I'll make this person unhappy through my gossip. Building block number one. They may go to all the way up to building block up here, violence. Well, since I didn't succeed, I will beat the living crap out of so-and-so. Therefore, they will be unhappy because it hurts. You better hope you're in shape when you're doing this. Violence. And that becomes part of you, a building block, trying to build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness. Satan tries to build his happiness on God's unhappiness. And God will never be, never has, never will be unhappy. And guess what? The believer who shares the happiness of God is not affected. Affected. The believer who shares the happiness of God is not affected by your stupid, supercilious, scheming. I hope you understand that. I hope you understand that when you try to build your happiness on someone else's unhappiness, the only thing that's going to happen is you will become unhappy. I will maintain my happiness, and whoever else shares the happiness of God will maintain happiness, happiness, happiness. And not only will they maintain happiness, they will build upon happiness times three. Because, have you never heard these things before? Triple compound discipline for you, triple compound blessing for me, or who else, or whoever else. And so happiness is built upon happiness when the believer says, I leave it in the Lord's hands. And you leave it in the Lord's hands. And that's all you do. And you let the Lord deal with it. You let the Lord deal between who's right and wrong. I'll tell you who's wrong right off. The person who's trying to build their happiness on someone else's unhappiness is in the wrong immediately. Because you can't do it and it doesn't work. You just become more and more unhappy. And you're treading on such thin ice you don't even know. You don't even know... You wouldn't do it if you had a clue. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a person sows, that will he also reap. You don't understand that. You think of sins in terms of the big, the big uh, three, fornication and all that. Fornication and uh, adultery and uh, drunkenness. And you, th you say those are the big three. No, when you get involved in trying to make some other believer unhappy, you're off the team, you're working against the team, and you are in for the worst of punishment. And it's unbelievable that people haven't caught on to that. 
Some people said they listen to Thane. I don't believe they have been listening daily. Some people have bragged they listen to seven and eight a day. If they have, they haven't been filled with the Spirit because I know better. Because I am one who studies that much. People don't understand it. They don't understand. How can a young person know more than me? That's not possible. Of course it's possible. You're just too arrogant to recognize it. Jesus Christ was 30 years old when he was teaching to a bunch of idiots. And they listened. They were still idiotic. It took them a long time to ever even recognize it. The only person who ever really recognized it was a man who understood humility to start with, and that was the Apostle Paul. At Saul of Tarsus, he was a man under humility. He grew up under very strict circumstances. He grew up studying under Gamaliel, and Gamaliel took no guff off of anybody. Kind of like a Catholic school, except probably five times worse. You know what they do in Catholic school? You start nodding off, start going to sleep, or you start... Uh, uh, talking in class whack with a ruler on your hand he grew up in such an environment and he memorized in such an environment the whole Old Testament under the great teacher Gamaliel he was a great teacher in the law whether he became a believer or not I'm not sure but he was a great teacher in the law and the apostle Paul as Saul of Tarsus studied under the greatest teacher ever and he had humility and he started out with humility. You say, wasn't it arrogant to try to kill Christians? Of course. But he got out of that. Why? Well, Jesus Christ humiliated him by making him blind. Do you want to be humiliated? Do you want God to humiliate you? It might make you blind or something else. Uh, when uh, In Jeremiah's day, when... They took over the king. They made the king, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but they made that king during that day. It wasn't Hezekiah, it's Jeremiah's day. They made that king blind. They plopped out his eyeballs. Then he got positive toward the word. Before that, he never was. He had to be humiliated before he would ever, ever listen. Oh, he had the prophets telling him stuff, but he knew more than the prophets. How do you translate that today? He knew more than the gift of pastor teacher and it is a gift. Not everybody can do it. It's insane to think that uh, God hasn't given out that many gifts of pastor teacher. You know that because uh, nobody wants the doctrine. And it's insane. It's insane to want the gift. I'll tell you that much. you got to be nuts to even desire it. If you desire it, you probably don't have it. I never desired it. It just so happened. Never had a desire. It just happened. It's unbelievable what uh, people get involved in when it comes to arrogance and how they view themselves and how they view themselves as already knowing more when they don't. They can't. So evil comes from Satan. The origin of evil is Satan's genius to devise a system to oppose God. Satan has come up with a system to oppose God. Next point. Evil originated in the angelic creation in the greatest creature to ever come from the hand of God. Once again, evil originated in the angelic creation in the greatest creature to ever come from the hand of God. Now we've noted this before and I'll go through the profile of Satan very quickly because we've gone through it and there's no need for you to even write it down again. You can look back in your notes. For those of you who attend on more than once a Sunday, you can look back in your notes. He is the highest of all creatures, number one. Number two, he rules one-third of all fallen angels. Number three, if Satan could take on human appearance as fallen angels did before the flood, he would be the most beautiful, he would be the smartest, he would be the strongest of all human beings. 
So much for those who emphasize their physical prowess. God can take away your physical prowess, and God is not impressed that you can run one mile. I'm not saying it's bad if you do it. I'm saying God's not impressed with it. It's not spirituality. It is not spirituality to run a mile. It is not spirituality to be so thin that if you ran around the shower you wouldn't get wet. That is not spirituality. Some, finally somebody laughed. That was meant to be a joke. Guarantee you something. I don't have to run around in the shower to get wet and I thank God for it. I'm glad he gives me all the food I ever need. Boy, am I going to eat it too. He said, what about gluttony? Shut up. <laughs> so evil originated in the angelic creation. In the pro and you don't know nothing about gluttony. I know a lot about it. You don't even know what it's about. He is the highest of all creatures. But we're not studying it, so you're not going to get to learn about it. Wait till the next message when I chew you out. He is the ruler of one-third of the angels. He is the central antagonist. Satan is the central antagonist of the angelic conflict. Meaning he's the one who nitpicks God all the time. And guess what? When you get in the cosmic system, you're just like Satan. You nitpick, you nitpick God. You want to know something? When you nitpick a pastor right or wrong you're nitpicking an authority God has set before you let me say that again when you nitpick a pastor whether right or wrong you are nitpicking the authority that God has set before you that's why when you leave you keep your mouth shut I don't need to know about it why do I need to know I don't give a shit. Why do I need to know? Ooh, don't say shit. Yeah, we must be proper around here, I guess. I don't need to know. Nobody needs to know. If you want to leave, leave. And that, and God has set up the authority. And believe me, Apostle Paul said shit. He did. I'll bring it out when we go through some of his epistles. Now, I could be friendly about it and say human excrement. Human excrement. You're full of human excrement. It's the same thing. It's called language. And if you can't get over language and you're too legalistic to get over language, what are you going to do when the fifth cycle comes upon you, buddy? You'll be the first one screaming those cuss words running down the street. What are you going to do when the fifth cycle comes? You're going to be all proper about it? No, you're not. What do you do when you and your wife get in an argument? Are you all proper about it? No! So don't you judge me. I know what you do behind closed doors. <laughs> you cuss at each other. And you rant and you rave. Well, it's part of being married. Not for me. For you! I have plus H. You don't. You see, that's the difference. I'm sure I've done it before, though. Not often. My wife is shaking her head no. She just has a bad memory. I'm sure I've done it before. If I'm doing it with you, I have done it with others. So Satan has set up this system whereby people can be nice Oh, you say, I shouldn't have said that, should I? You didn't know what I was about to teach next, did you? Evil. Evil. Satan has devised a system whereby people can be nice. Lovely. They can even pray about things prayerfully. <laughs> they can even mourn about things with tears flowing down their face. As if I believe that for one second. <laughs> But they can pray mournfully. And they can do this and that. And they can get all emotional. It's so sad. And they can seem so nice and lovely. And they can look good to society and look so sincere. 
Yet behind that facade of good there lurks evil! A destructive person who is often self-deceived himself. Behind all that good, behind all that nicety, behind all that sweetness and light, there could be the most evil person you've ever seen. That goes for legalists. That goes for legalists who pray about you prayerfully. And legalists will do that and they'll get around each other and they'll even build each other up. Let's pray for so and so. So and so seems to be going astray. We'll pray for them. And they will prayerfully consider. And on the surface there's nicety. But behind it all, deep in their souls, where God sees you, I don't, where God sees the thoughts and intents of your heart, there's nothing but evil. And the only thing you're prayerfully considering is to try to make someone else unhappy. Not going to work here. Take your mess elsewhere. I'm glad you did before I had to kick you out myself. Take your mess elsewhere. You're stupid. Ignorant. Ephesians 2.2 2 talks about how he set up a system of administration whereby Mr. High can function as Dr. Jekyll. I even told you about that earlier. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is Satan himself. On the one hand, Satan is full of niceties. And he's full of nice qualities. Yet on the other hand, behind it all, he's evil. And believers function under that system. And on the one side, they're phony. Phony as can be. And that's all they have. Why? They have no spirituality. When you're filled with the Spirit, you don't have to be phony. People are so phony today, it's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous, the phoniness of it all. People will rip each other apart behind their back, and then they'll walk in and they'll say, Oh, hello, how are you today? And they'll smile at them after they've done rip them apart. Phoniness! That's Satan for you. He's phony. And people follow in his system. They are phony. Satan controls most of Christianity today, 99.9% .9 of it, through his cosmic system. The thing that makes function people and the thing that makes people function in the cosmic system is arrogance, lack of of humility. I'm going to have to start hitting this home. Humility, humility, humility. You've got to know how to be humble. You wanted a church? you got to be humble. People don't know how to do it. People don't understand humility. They don't understand authority. They hop from job to job. Why? No. Humility. I never hopped from job to job. I had humility. And a lot of people get upset with the boss and hop off and run away. As soon as the boss does something wrong, hop off and run away. I've had, a, I've had some bosses you wouldn't believe. And you say, no, -uh, I've had bosses you wouldn't believe. Well, see, there you go. Did you stay there or did you get huffy? Stay there as long as they'll keep you. You say, but I could have got more somewhere else. Well, if the opportunity comes along, well, that's fine. But realize that place where you're going to make more money, it's going to be more old sin natures. And guess what? You might be there making more money and you might be even more miserable. What did the Bible say? As long as you have food and clothing, be happy. <laughs> when you know what that means, God's always going to provide us our food and clothing until it's time to go to be with Him. Don't worry about it. People worry about that all the time. People worry about that so much they even miss Bible class over it. You can understand if you're on a different shift. They miss Bible class over something stupid. 
Miss Bible class over a race. Miss Bible class over cheerleading. Miss Bible class over football game. Miss Bible class over this, that, and the other. That's your choice. That is your choice. I've never said it wasn't your choice, but don't force your choice on me. And don't tell me when to start class because you want to fool around with the details of life. See, I've never told you you had to show up. Don't tell me what to do. If you don't want to show up because of some stupid little event, you didn't have to. There needs to be a clarification. I can do it from the pulpit better than from every, anywhere else. The only thing I've ever done here is teach doctrine. It's the only thing I'm ever going to do and it's the only thing I'm going to do from here on out. From here on out, nothing else is going to be said about it from this pulpit. I'm just going to teach doctrine from now on. But you better understand you're messing with fire when you mess with the pastor-teacher. If you don't understand that, you don't understand Scripture because I could give you the many Scriptures and have given them to you before, but it either wasn't a Sunday and you weren't there, or you were watching a game and you weren't there, or you were watching racing and you weren't there, or you were cheerleading and you weren't there, or you were doing your so precious homework and you weren't there, or, or you just weren't there, or even if you did listen, you were too busy thinking about what to eat after class. You never were positive to start with and not filled with the Spirit, just pissed off all the time. And if that's the way you were, you're not going to get anywhere. Not my fault. The only thing I've ever done is teach doctrine, 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 doctrine. And that's what I'm going to continue to do. And I'm going to be tough about it. I know why my pastor was tough about it. He had to be. When he got mellow about it, nobody listened to him anymore. Imagine that. But I'm going to be tough about it. There is an authority here. And our nation needs toughness now more than it ever has needed it before. Because when this country goes under the five cycles of discipline, I again ask, are you going to be watching your language? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be watching my language? No, you're going to be too worried about yourself. You weren't prepared. You weren't prepared doctrinally for what's about to hit us. And what's about to hit us is something we can't imagine. We've never lived through it. We can't imagine it. Whether young or old, we can't imagine what's about to happen. And it's going to happen. There's way too much arrogance in this country. And God will flush it out. And if, he, and if we refuse to become humble, as it says, humble yourselves in Second Chronicles chapter 7, if you fail to humble yourselves, God will wipe us out as a client nation takes humility to be a client nation of which we have none absolutely none so when everyone commits a sin he becomes an agent of the devil now that's found in 1 John 3 8 in 1 John 3 8 it says when anyone commits a sin he has become the agent of the devil you know what that means very simply when you commit a sin you fall into the cosmic system period Whenever you commit a sin, you fall into the cosmic system. And how do you remain outside of sin? Rebound, 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 rebound when you wake up in the morning. You say, I can't think of anything. Rebound arrogance. Rebound all the time. And what's that mean when you rebound all the time? It means... Number one on your scale of values and number one in your thoughts is God and rapport with God, not with silly people. It's ridiculous. People think, if you think I care about people, you're nuts. It has to do with the filling of God the Holy Spirit. Besides, I never called anyone out on sleeping. Never have called anyone out on sleeping through Bible class. I did it on purpose because they were looking for me to do it. But I've never called anyone out on sleeping. And uh, as much as you slept every Sunday, what's it matter? What am I doing? I'm making a sword to start beating people. I'm so angry. And I'm playing. It's a joke. Chill. 
So L.S. Schaefer put, put it best in volume two, as I've stu we've noted before. The old sin nature is usually the source of temptation, and volition is the source of sin. The old sin nature is the source of temptation, volition is the source of sin. That is, you're tempted, but when you sin, it's your choice. The old sin nature's in you, but you can ignore it. Not all the time you can't. One time you're going to sin, then you need to rebound, rebound, rebound. The works of the devil can only be destroyed by resonance and function inside the divine dinosphere. That is, you rebound, you function inside God's power sphere, that is the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and as long as you're filled with God the Holy Spirit, you function outside of the cosmic system. Therefore, you don't say stupid things anymore in the, in the divine dinosphere. You learn how to keep your mouth shut. You know, I need to come up with a doctrine. Maybe we'll study it after Satanology. I have loved teaching Satanology. It has been a blast. Maybe after Satanology, I'll need to teach something like this. Long on words, short on doctrine. That's the way most people are today. Long on words, short on doctrine. They sure do know how to talk a good fight. They can get up and ramble and ramble and ramble. They're short on doctrine. Long on words. You know a lot of people like that. You know people like that. That's why you're laughing. People always rambling and rambling and rambling, long on words, short on doctrine. It's one thing to talk on when you know what you're talking about, but when you just ramble and ramble and ramble, well, the more you talk, the more stupid you let yourself be known. Well, this is this comes out of poetry and everything else. The more you talk, the more either people will, if you talk a lot, people will find out you're either smart or stupid. That's it. If you talk too much, they're going to find out you're stupid. If you're stupid, it's best to be short on words. Anyway, this is what needs to be turned around. And I mean it. It's even in the Bible. doesn't mean you can't be gregarious and talk in a party, etc. I'm talking about something else here. Yeah, that looks funny. But you need to be short on words and long on doctrine. In other words, keep your mouth shut. What is so funny about that? Short on words, long on doctrine. If there's any perverts here, I might need to throw them out. What's going on? What? What? What's so funny? That's S H. I know it looks funny. H. Oh. Well, that's for retarded people. <laughs> we have a few listening, by the way. <laughs> I figured I might need to, you know, explain to them better. Short on words, long on doctrine. Don't laugh at me. Let me know where it's wrong. Anyway, maybe this should be our next subject. But we're still continuing technology because I'm not scared. <laughs> I'll just keep going. And this is what we will study tomorrow. Just one lesson tonight. Tomorrow night we will continue with evil. I'll do two lessons tomorrow and we should be done with Satan. Hope he's done with me and we'll be done with him. And then we'll move on to short on words, long on doctrine or the other way around. I probably won't even ever teach that. Just wanted to show it to you. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us as to the importance of humility. May he enlighten us as to the importance of the Word of God and how it is the message and not the man. It is always the message and not the man and not his personality. In whose name we pray, amen.